Hello, this is Alison Van Edenham speaking to you from the Beef Improvement Federation End Product uh, Improvement Session and my topic is Are Alternative Meats an End Product Improvement? Um, and I guess to me I need to know what that means. Does it mean you've got better product attributes, better taste, better price, better nutritional attributes, better sustainability metrics? Um, and so I'm going to look into the evidence base to kind of ask these questions of these uh, alternative meats. First, I'm going to go over what an alternative meat is for those of you that are, are not uh, familiar with this area. So the first kind of product line, if you will, is vegan meat substitutes. Um, so they used to be called veggie burgers, but um, basically you're using plant-based um, concentrates and proteins, often from legumes, um, that are then broken down and added to binders and fats and flavors to give them a meat-like taste. And then very importantly, nutrients are added to at least meet the amount of nutrients in meat for things like B12 and iron and the like. Um, and then these um, nutrients are often produced in using cellular agriculture to, to bring in things like proteins and, and other compounds that are synthesized in recombinant yeast and microbes, then purified and you can add things like vitamin B12, which are harvested and then added to this final product. And for example, the Impossible Burger adds um, soy leg hemoglobin in, um, to add iron to their final patty or, or hamburger and these products are typified by things like the Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger or Just which is a, a plant-based mayonnaise and they're quite distinct um, from in vitro or cultured or cell-based meat where you're there going in and taking a biopsy from a cow or a pig or a chicken or a fish whatever it is and you take this stem cell and you basically multiply it through exponential growth uh, in a bioreactor. And a bioreactor is basically heated to 37 degrees and they're fed with a medium containing amino acids and salts and sugars to really rapidly grow these cells in culture. And, and this bioreactor basically replaces, if you will, the body of a cow. Um, so it's responsible for providing nutrients, removing waste, keeping it um, safe from um, diseases and microbial contamination. And then at the end, you change the culture conditions to push the cells to differentiate into muscle and fat and connective tissue and put that all together and you end up with a, a cultured meat product. And it's, there's a lot of venture capital buzz around this topic. So according to an A.T. Kearney report, um, these novel vegan meat replacements and cultured meat have the potential to disrupt the meat industry. And they predict um, that by 40%, uh, by 2040, 40% of global meat consumption will still come from conventional meat sources. That's 20 years time. <laughs> um, and that's really um, driven a lot of venture capital. And so this same report says there's been about $50 million in global funding for the cultured meat um, companies and about $900 million for the uh, vegan meat replacement brands with things like um, Just and, and um, Impossible Burger and Beyond Burger. And who's investing? Well, interestingly, there's some familiar faces here, um, perhaps very familiar as of recent days. Um, but there's a lot of um, celebrity buzz, uh, not only very wealthy venture capitalists um, and ironically, even some that own airlines, um, but also uh, celebrities and then some familiar names to this audience, I would think, in that they're traditional protein producers who also are investing. And according to the Good Food Institute, which is basically a, 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 um, a lobbying group, I guess, who are laser focused on using markets and food technology to transform our food system away from factory farmed animal products and towards clean meat and plant based alternatives, they suggest that these um, companies are, are ready to flourish in the post uh, COVID-19 area and there's been about $741 million raised in the first quarter of 2020, which nearly matched all of what was raised in, in 2019 and you can see some of the big um, venture um, bets there. And I think that they're coming in because according to this AT Kearney report, um, which suggests that by 2040, as I said, that only 40% of conventional will be meat will be produced by conventional meat. And here's a chicken leg. They suggest that perhaps 25% will be the plant-based burgers and 35% will be cultured meat. 
And I think that's a pretty, pretty big number. Um, but there's actually a way you can kind of get an estimate on what are we talking about here because the FAO has estimates of, of how much um, meat we're likely to be producing in 2040 and it's kind of shown on this slide here. This is FAO data and we're estimated to produce 1,751 million metric tons of animal source proteins in 2040. By far the majority milk and then of course fish is the largest meat category. But I'm going to give the, the um, estimate the benefit of the doubt and suggest that they were just talking about replacing terrestrial meat, that is cattle, pigs and chickens, um, with these alternative source proteins by 2050. So what that suggests is that by 2050, um, 402 million metric tonnes of terrestrial meat will be produced, of which 60% will come from alternative protein sources. Just to give you a feel for the numbers involved in that, I did a kind of a back of the envelope calculation and said if we're going to have 35% will be vegan meat replacements and uh, sorry, 35% will be cultured meat and 25% will be um, vegan meat replacements. Then you do the math and 25% of 402 million metric tons and then you times that by quarter pounders because that's basically the metric of, of this um, discussion. That will require somewhere around about 886 billion quarter pounders annually to be 25% uh, of global meat production. And the 35% is going to be somewhere over 1 trillion uh, in vitro burgers are need to be produced in 20 years time. And just to kind of put that in context, there's not a single burger produced using cultured meat at the current time. There's nothing on the market. Um, whereas here we do have some plant-based burgers that are being sold. Um, so that's a pretty big ask. So let's have a look at what data there is out there to ask if um, there's an evidence base for the assessment of end product improvement. And so basically I've got attributes listed here and this just kind of puts things in perspective. So we produce about 105 billion pounds of meat annually in the US and that's about 99.8% by volume of meat that's produced. The vegan meat replacements at the current time produce about 200 million pounds per year or about 0.2% of the supply and cultured meat as I said has produced nothing to date. And so because there's nothing on the market, it's really hard to get an estimate of the nutritional attributes, the price, the taste or the sustainability metrics. So this is all kind of a big question mark. But there is some product on the market here. So we can compare nutrition and price. Taste, I feel, is kind of a personal preference thing. I find it hard to have an objective measurement there. So I'm just going to leave that to personal preference. And then the sustainability metrics, we absolutely can have a look at the data on that. And so that's what I'd like to do. I will just spend a little time on cultured meat, even though there's nothing in the market, because you hear so much about it. And basically, as I mentioned, that living cells are introduced into a bioreactor, which has to be provided with nutrients in a suitable growth medium containing food grade components that has to be effective and efficient in supporting and promoting muscle cell growth. And I actually grow cells in my own molecular lab. Um, and you, the growth medium typically contains things including um, products derived from fetal bovine and horses that will have to not be present in these um, basically vegan or the, in these in these products that are trying to um, replace animal source foods and typically we raise ours with antibiotics because it's really hard to keep these cultures um, free of, of all microbes and so it's not going to be easy to get effectively a defined medium that will grow animal cells in culture and that's what the companies are working towards and additionally, you need to basically add a whole bunch of um, nutrients in order to match or exceed the nutritional value of conventional meat products. And typically, these meat pro these um, nutrients are going to be added in from fermentation or culture, but they're going to have to have the essential amino acids, vitamin B12, iron, micronutrients, and all of the um, basically nutrition that comes from a, from a typical meat product. And so it's not going to be trivial to do that. Last year, the first company started to build the first lab-grown meat production facility. This is in Jerusalem, and it's called Future, Future Meat Technologies. 
and it's going to establish the world's first cultured meat pilot production facility producing GMO free meat <laughs> you know that really excited me to see them uh, using that term cultivated directly from animal cells on a commercial scale and that's kind of an interesting statement because if they're going GMO free that's going to make it really hard for them to source those ingredients that would be otherwise produced in recombinant microbes like soy hemoglobin or B12 um, to introduce the same nutrient profile as meats and they plan to establish the facility um, and they basically have started their development efforts due to 14 million dollars secured in in series uh, a funding and the company says that its laboratory based manufacturing model results in 99 percent less land use and 80 percent fewer greenhouse gas emissions than traditionally produced meat I'm not sure where they got those numbers from given they haven't actually produced anything and so it's hard to do a life cycle analysis you have to basically anticipate all of those numbers um, and that it plans to introduce hybrid products into the market combining plant proteins for texture with cultured fats to create the aroma and flavor of meat and I think that's a really interesting thing what they're suggesting here is they're going to use plant fillers and then some of the product will be basically this cultured meat and at the moment the existing costs are 150 per pound for chicken and 200 per pound for beef um, but with this hybrid product they hope to get to a competitive cost level by 2021 um, and that's uh, going to be interesting to see if they're able to accomplish this they plan to basically double um, the fibroblast cells in mass every 24 hours and produce cell growing chicken lamb and beef in only two weeks um, I, I think that's a big ask it, it's a basically funded by a bunch of venture capitalists and with this investment we're thrilled to bring cultured meat from the lab to the factory floor and to begin working with our industrial partners to bring our product to market and I find it a bit ironic that um, some of the things that are used to criticize animal ags factory farms and industrial agriculture is actually the definition of what we're talking about here because we are actually talking about producing food in a factory um, and so it's interesting how that's uh, not not seen as a negative in this particular case so this all started because in 2013 there was a Dutch professor who unveiled unveiled the world's first slaughter free hamburger which was basically cultured in a lab for a cost of around about 335 US thousand US dollars um, and that effort was funded by Sergi Brin who was the co-founder of Google um, and at the time uh, Mark Post who's a professor um, and who still argues that to date there's no process for proliferating not just muscle cells but also fat cells which are particularly relevant for taste and it's also not yet possible to produce larger pieces of meat such as steaks using in vitro culture and I guess I, I would beg to differ I think we do actually have a method for producing such products and basically the bioreactor that we use to do that is called a rumen um, and it's basically a self-propelling self-cleaning solar powered cellulose driven bioreactor that has the ability to produce highly nutritious animal source foods but the byproduct is methane as a result of digesting this otherwise undigestible cellulose to produce that product and um, I think that it's going to be hard to compete against this biologically driven system according to another report from the rethink X the fermentation farms are going to be the new farms that's the cell culture farms and that by 2030 so they're upping the game and saying in 10 years time 70% of all beef consumed will come from modern production methods by that they mean not cows I'm assuming so I'm a bit of a scientist and I looked at the graph they had in their report so 70% by 2030 I'm oh, sorry I drew a line and it's like they didn't even get that right <laughs> um, but I do know I'm sitting in 2020 so I do know what 2019 looked like and according to them in 2019 10% of beef is being produced from modern methods and so is that actually true no it's not 10% of meat production is not coming from alternative meat sources nothing's coming from in vitro and in the United States we produce more than 105 billion pounds of animal meat each year and the best estimates of US plant-based meat production 
hovers around 200 million pounds per year, which is about 0.2% of total meat volume or about 1% of value. Um, and so it, it kind of frustrates me that they can't even get that right when the data is actually there to, to evaluate it. So now let's switch gears and talk about these plant-based burgers. So we've gone from in vitro to plant-based, so the beyond and impossible. And although they get a lot of the action, there's actually quite a few brands of these meat alternatives. And by far the biggest market share belongs to Morningstar Farms, which has been around for a long time. Um, and basically these, these are veggie burgers. Um, so here's Beyond, which is um, in this gray bar here. You hear a lot about Beyond. But there have been a lot of players on the market for quite a long time. Um, and I think that it's important to, to realize that, that this, this market share has been around. Um, and since COVID, there's been a real kind of amplification of the, the plant-based meat um, increase in sales. And I saw this from the Good Food um, Institute saying that the plant-based meat dollar sales growth has consistently outperformed animal-based meat dollar sales growth. And so here's COVID in the US starting back in March. And you can see that there was this huge jump um, as everybody basically started hoarding toilet paper and the like. And it went up to 158%. And on average, it's been at about 86% increase relative to the 45% that the beef and, and animal-based um, meat dollar sales growth has increased. And you might think, well, that bodes really badly. But I think it's really important to keep things in perspective. So just remember that plant-based meat is about 200 million pounds a year and animal-based meat is about 105,000 or 105 billion tons. So when we're talking about increases like this, when we're talking the plant-based increase is about 100 million pound, uh, dollars of, of, of intake, that's a $5,000 million increase or $5 billion increase in animal-based sales. And so a, a, a proportional increase of a small thing is easier to achieve than a proportional increase of a large thing. And these are stunning in proportional <laughs> increases in animal-based um, food that's been purchased. And US ground beef sales have been up a billion dollars in 2020. And year to date through May 17, the meat department dollar sales were up um, about 24.8% and that reflected an additional $5.5 billion sold versus the same period last year. Um, and similarly, um, in terms of total amount produced, it's about a 7.6 billion pound increase. So um, the, the meat department's been doing pretty well during this COVID thing as well. In fact, it's been doing so well that it's actually cut in a little bit to the plant-based share of the total meat category. And we can see that that's gone down a little bit just because um, there's been so much absolute sales of meat in the nine-week period ending May, May 10th. And so um, that's basically what's been going on in COVID. So are there data available to make an evidence-based assessment of end product improvement? Let's have a look at price. And really, there's only two products that I'm going to talk about here, and that's the Beyond Burger and the Impossible Burger. And this is kind of an interesting breakdown of these two products. So the Beyond Burger is made of basically peas, and it includes um, a lot of um, coconut uh, butter and oil to give it the white flex. But they made an interesting discover or decision to be non-GMO. And so they're labeled non-GMO, which basically means that they can't add a lot of the nutrients that you would normally expect to see in, in meat products. And that has a real impact on its nutri nutritional profile. Impossible Burger, shown here, is made up mostly of soy. So both legumes, peas and soy. They also have coconut oil. And then they've added things like soy leg hemoglobin that's produced in genetically engineered bacteria and things like vitamin B12 um, that are produced in um, recombinant uh, organisms also. So they've, they haven't tied their hands by saying, I'm not going to use technology. Um, I'm going to use technology and I'm going to produce a product that's nutritionally as similar to beef as I can. 
and in general these products are more expensive this was just the value when I or the price when I googled it uh, on my computer because I can't go to the grocery store um, and basically you know on a per ounce basis depending beefs somewhere around about four to eight depending if it's you know grass-fed or wagyu or, or just conventional beef so on average they're two to three times more expensive than beef products on a price um, basis and that's kind of the the data that's out there um, and then are there data available to make an evidence-based assessment of end product improvements as it relates to nutrition and this is a breakdown of the nutritional attributes of the Beyond Burger, the Impossible Burger and the Beef Burger um, and so the Beyond and Impossible are in green here and then beef is shown in this um, brown color and then you can see protein um, is pretty similar between the three of them and then kind of depending what what nutritional attribute you're interested in um, there's differences and similarities um, so they have similar amounts of fat similar amounts of saturated fat only the beef burger has cholesterol which might be a bad thing for some people only these plant-based burgers have carb carbohydrate there's no dietary fiber in beef burger um, I'm not sure I normally eat a burger for dietary fiber there is some in the plants but there's a whole bunch of nutrients where we really just don't know so that's where if I don't have the answer to this I, I can't really respond but I kind of highlighted in in um, red ones that I think are quite different so there's quite a bit of salt or sodium in the the plant-based burgers compared to a conventional burger and then interestingly when we look at vitamins um, and particularly ones that um, we're, we're interested in like B12 it's just not listed on the Beyond Burger but given that they're not allowed to use um, GMO ingredients I'm guessing that they're probably not there um, whereas the Impossible Burger um, has pretty analogous vitamin B12 to the to the beef burger um, and if you go along here for example it's got more folate um, which is important to, to pregnant women um, similar amounts of vitamin B6 and niacin and just a really uh, higher amounts of riboflavin a really 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 big amount of thiamine and perhaps you know one of the other important attributes you eat meat for is, is iron um, and they have higher levels of iron but it's not as bioavailable as iron that you might expect to see in a, in a, um, a beef burger so that's kind of the the data on the nutritional attributes so some some good some bad fairly similar I would say um, overall uh, to the nutritional composition of a beef burger especially impossible burger which has the added nutrients that you would expect to see in a beef burger and so a lot of the rationale for eating these is the environmental implications and so let's have a look at what the data are in that regard and I'm going to cite from this paper by Hannah Tumesto um, that was published last year that does a really nice job of comparing these products on a kilogram of protein basis um, and so this is in this case the greenhouse gas emissions of different protein sources um, and we can look across here and we see the ruminants the monogastrics um, the products of monogastric or eggs and milk and then the meat substitutes are basically the the vegan burgers the impossible burger type thing cultured meat is growing the cells in culture and then insects and then pulses for those of you that aren't familiar with that term is basically a subset of the legumes that is the dry seeds um, and you can compare that to the, the soybeans and peanuts are also legumes but they um, have too much oil to be pulses and then spirulina is a type of um, algae and what you'll see is if you're really interested in decreasing your greenhouse gas emissions that these these three tend to come in low the whole way across insects pulses and spirulina there's a couple of truisms and that is in general animals have a higher carbon footprint than plants so that's not unexpected you're going up a trophic level and in general ruminants tend to have higher greenhouse gas emissions than monogastrics because they're eating cellulose or grass and the rumen is basically breaking down that indigestible cellulose and producing methane from the from the bugs in the rumen that's not the case in these ones but these guys of course the poultry the monogastrics have to be provided with feed that they can digest and that is 
going to be more directly competing with human food sources than these guys that are out on land that has no other human food purpose. And so there's, there's some nuances here, but I think that in general it's fair to say that there's increased levels of um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with a kilogram of ruminant protein. If we look at the land use, um, not unexpectedly again, we see the ruminants up here having high land use because they're using rangeland that has no other human food purpose and they need large amounts of um, forage to and large amounts of land to, to collect that forage. So they're using a different land resource than necessarily pork or poultry are. Um, and I think it's interesting to note that this particular author who um, was one of the original um, authors of a, of a cultured meat life cycle analysis, which was very um, anticipatory because we really don't have anything growing so you kind of have to predict what, what the um, life cycle might be. She wrote in this paper that she did in 2019 a, almost a defense of livestock production because it's, a, it's livestock production, especially extensive cattle grazing, maintains various habitats and species and is therefore beneficial for biodiversity. Thus, a complete elimination of livestock is not reasonable from the perspective of biodiversity and also argues that they're part of a sustainable agricultural system as they recycle nutrients and they utilize plants that humans cannot consume as food. Um, I was very surprised to read that in this in this paper, but I think that um, it's good to see the recognition of the important ecosystem services provided by ruminants. And then the final environmental impact that, that this paper looks at is the energy use of different protein sources. And here we see quite a different picture. We see high levels for fish here because this is ocean caught fish and there's quite high energy use to go out and catch those fish in terms of running the motorboats out there. But here we had to start to see actually higher levels for the meat substitutes and particularly the cultured meat. Again, this is anticipatory. But why would you have high energy levels? Well, basically you're replacing a biological system with industrial electricity or energy to keep that incubator warm and to basically do all the cleaning and all the rest of it that comes along with replacing the body of a cow with industrial inputs. And so that puts a bit of a different perspective. And I think it's important to look at in the US um, where are the sources and sinks of greenhouse gases? And I think this is often um, overlooked in this whole discussion because if we look overall at the greenhouse gas emissions that are produced in the US, in 2018 there was 6,677 million metric tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents. But that never looks at the fact that there's quite a big sink coming from land like um, land use and forestry. In other words, ag and forestry is sucking in carbon dioxide and sequestering it. And the vast majority of the greenhouse gases, in fact 75% of US carbon dioxide emissions, is from the combustion of fossil fuel. And this sequestration of carbon dioxide by the land sector is actually greater, it's 12% of greenhouse gas emissions, than all of agriculture, which is 10% of US greenhouse gas emissions. And of that, animal ag is 4%. And so what happens if we replace the 10% of agriculture, or specifically the 4% that is animal agriculture, with products that are grown in a factory that are being powered by electricity? What will be the trade-offs associated with replacing agriculture with industrial food production? And I think that we really need to understand those metrics before we convert 70% of our beef production to alternative protein sources. And I think I'm just going to finish with this kind of um, ironic slide that, or ironic statement that's in one of these um, think tank reports who suggests that by 2030, so 10 years time, cattle pasture rangeland and feed cropland will decline by about 50%. This will disrupt the US beef and dairy industries by modern production methods and will free up about 300 million acres of land by 2030, rising to 450 million acres by 2035. 
I'm not sure what they mean by free up. Last I checked that land was privately held land. Um, but what I really found interesting was as they pondered what would happen to this land by 2030, this so-called free land, and they suggested maybe it could be um, rewilded. But they actually ended up suggesting, and I'm actually quoting them here, that the best proxy for land that has no alternative productive use might be ranch land. <laughs> uh, the irony of that statement is perhaps not lost on this audience, um, but I guess on that point, I agree with them. <laughs> um, and I think that uh, with that, I will finish and I hope to see you in the real world soon. Iowa and Iowa State University are proud to host the 2021 Beef Improvement Federation Annual Research Symposium and Convention. The convention will be located in downtown Des Moines with easy access to the airport, hotels, and local restaurants. Iowa State University is just north with its research and teaching farms. Join us in Iowa and experience how Iowa provides the beef industry with innovation to application. <laughs>